Hello, everybody. Welcome back here on our weekly Penguins chat. Andrew Destin joined by Matt Benzel, ringing in the new year with you guys here uh, after a couple of week break there around the holidays. Um, checking in with the Penguins after a pretty strong December. Um, but before we get into any of that, uh, Matt, how we doing? You're uh, on the ground there in Philadelphia ahead of the game on a Monday night against the Flyers, huh? That's right. Yeah, I'm here in uh, Philly where everyone is really stoked about the results of last night's American football game. So, um, yeah. Should be a should be an angry crowd tonight. Yeah, w- would you expect anything less? But I, I suppose on the heels of the Eagles losing to the Giants, that'll uh, that'll rile up the Flyer fan base a little bit more, huh? <laughs> uh, but you know, we got to get into a lot of Penguins discussion here. Leading off, wanted to talk to you about um, the strong December the Penguins had. Obviously, a few games here coming out of the New Year um, as well. But wanted to touch base on that a little bit since the last we chatted. And overall, uh, the Penguins went seven three and three in a strong month of December. Um, I'll just pose it to you this way for what was kind of an important one to keep playoff hopes alive for the Penguins, even though we are still somewhat early in the season. Um, what worked well for the team uh, in that strong month? Uh, they have Sidney Crosby. That would be <laughs> that would be a lot of it. Um, you know, you can point to a lot of little things. I mean, the power play has I think they have nine power play goals in their last 10 games or maybe it's 10 out of 11. But they snapped out of that slump. The PK has stabilized a little bit now that they've gotten Achari and Rust and Ruedel back. Um, goaltending has been uh, pretty good, at least, uh, you know, definitely so when Nadelkovic has been in net. Um, so there's a lot of little things. You know, the, the bottom six quietly is not killing them. Um, you know, they, they are scoring some goals, but also they're not allowing a lot of them. But, you know, I think so much of it is Sid and to a lesser degree, his his two wingers who are Jake Gensel and Ricardo Kell right now. Um, Sid's been incredible. Yeah. And what's been the most impressive thing, I guess, to you about Sid, right? It's easy to pinpoint on the goals. It would be easy to say, you know, maybe, you know, he's a guy who's all over the ice. But what do you think has been the most impressive aspect of him doing this in the age 36 season? It's just like the consistency and the totality of it. I mean, I always laugh because we all ask like Mike Sullivan, like every week there's like new, some new milestone with Sid or um, some big play and Sullivan has to go up to the podium there and and try to figure out a different way to talk about how amazing this guy is. Um, So it's probably a difficult task, but he found a way to come up with a new way to talk about Sid the other day by just kind of marveling about his consistency and how day in and day out um, you know, Sid's doing all the work on and off the ice to put himself in position to still be dominant. And I do think that's a great way to sum up how Sid has been this year. I mean, it seems like every single big goal or rally, um, you know, the captain's been right there in the middle of it, whether he's scoring, um, you know, making another incredible play or, or even just hustling to, you know, to negate that icing call a couple games ago. So, um, you know, the game, the game winning goal he had in Boston that same game. Um, he won the faceoff. I mean, he's been as best as I think his faceoff rate is as, as best as it's ever been. Better as it's better been, or if not, it's close. So it's just like the all around brilliance um, of Sidney Crosby, and it's also him rising to the occasion, time in and time out. I, I think has really helped kind of get this team back in gear and has them within striking distance of a playoff spot. And and he's talked so many times about how it's nice to have Evgeny Malkin for those off nights that he has, right, where, you know, he can pick up the slack from. There haven't been many of those. It feels like it really has been Sid night in and night out kind of carrying that load. But um, I suppose it doesn't hurt that Malkin had a better month to December because that was a pretty forgettable November, huh? Yeah, I mean, I still think Malkin and his line mates leave a lot to be desired. I mean, you know, on one hand, we're sitting here talking about how great Sid has been and how he's been involved in pretty much everything. I think that also speaks to the fragility of this team. Um, yeah. You know, if Sid were to kind of go in a slump or, um, you know, knock on wood, you don't want to see a guy get injured, but he is 36. If he was even to exit the lineup for two or three weeks, um, you know, that could be devastating for these teams' chances. So, you know, if you talk about Malkin, we have seen some signs of life from him, but, you know, that's a line they really need to get going. Um, him and Riley Smith. I mean, Riley Smith has been a big disappointment. Um, you know, he just is not noticeable most nights. Um, can't help but wonder when they go to Vegas next week, if he's just going to try to skip the t- team bus and stay there um, <laughs> because he clearly wasn't happy about being traded. And I don't know if he's gotten over it. So, yeah, I mean, that second line, um, you know, that that's it seems like every year that's kind of like the the X factor or one of the big X factors for this team. Whereas, you know, if Malkin is is playing well and not a liability defensively and feeling confident, then the team 
you know, has those two centers, those two lines that can really drive the team. And when Malkin is struggling, um, disengaged, making bad decisions, not scoring, um, you know, the Penguins, you know, simply aren't good enough the way they're constructed. So again, that's, you know, second half of the season. Um, you know, if the Pens are going to or do anything um, in the playoffs, should they get there? Um, you know, that's something that needs to change. It's the impact they're getting from the second line at five on five. Yeah, Riley Smith certainly wanted to bring up just given that goal sl- goal scoring slump, excuse me, that he's kind of been in after a first week when it looked like, oh, this is a guy who's going to seamlessly slide in and do what Jason Zucker did, albeit with a very different playing style. But it's been evident these last couple of months that's certainly not been the case. Um, well, it's just all been on the rush with those guys, and when that's dried up, they're just not scoring in other ways. I mean, it's it's pretty simple. Yeah, they're not establishing those own time, and we're seeing what's the results of it. But um, want to delve into a different topic that you brought up there briefly uh, when discussing that month of December. Um, it's the goalie tandem. You know, we've both written about this and talked about this before. What they're getting from Nadelkovich and Jari, um, obviously, right? It's a good problem to have to have two goalies who have played pretty well. But I guess the first question I'll pose to you is, are you surprised at all by the play they've gotten from both of these guys uh, as we close in on the halfway point of the season? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm surprised with both goalies in different ways. I mean, with Ndalkovic, um, you know, he had a few good starts to start the year, got hurt, came back, kind of kept it going. And, you know, you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to maybe drop with him because, you know, just, you know, last year he spent a lot of the year in the American Hockey League. He was sent there by Magnus Helberg, who is now the third goalie for the Penguins. Like he really struggled in Detroit. Um, and he's really rebuilt his game, rebuilt his confidence. He often will talk about Andy Kyoto, the goalie coach, um, who's a very good goalie coach. And with Andy, it's not even just the technical aspects of the game. Um, just from my observations, you know, he, he maybe is a little bit more um, open-minded about how he lets his guys like go about stopping the puck. But a big part for Andy is the mental part of the game, and that's something that Nadelkovic talks about all the time, just how Andy helped him reset after a, a difficult year in Detroit where he knows he didn't meet expectations. And he's talked a lot about just, like, staying in the moment, enjoying the grind. You know, the phrase he uses is on it, and it just kind of means not worrying about what everyone else is doing and just worrying about yourself. And, you know, I think uh, that's worked out pretty well for Nadelkovic. Um, You know, I'm about to head over to the – morning skate across the street. We're recording this Monday morning, full transparency, but I, I expect Nadelkovic is going to play against the Flyers. Um, you know, as you noted, they've been rotating the goalies. He played great uh, here in Philly a few weeks ago. Um, as for Jari, yeah, I'm a little surprised too, because it looked like he was turning the corner, had turned the corner, was playing really well for a while. I don't know. I mean, I, I've covered this guy for his entire NHL career. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but just for him to be playing so well and then kind of have just like that one bad game in Toronto and he just hasn't been able to get out of his own way. Um, you know, I know he allowed really two goals uh, their last game. Um, God, who do they even play? This <laughs> It was uh, real, literally two days ago. What's that? Sabres, Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. You can tell we're in midseason mode where it's just like a grind. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, the third goal came when he was trying to get to the bench and um, for the for the empty net. But even so, he just didn't look confident. That first goal was bad. Um, you know, Mike Sullivan, it's, it's always telling when Mike Sullivan is asked, like, oh, what did you think about your goalie? And if he says, I thought he competed hard and leave it at that, that kind of tells you maybe he didn't play well, but he fought hard. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, Jari is, is kind of going through it right now. Um and you would think that seeing the Delkovic would play well and having to kind of fight for his starts would kind of get Jari in gear. But right now he's kind of going through a little bit of a rut. But still, if you look at his season big picture wise, I think it's been a, a pretty good bounce back for Tristan. Yeah, it's such an interesting one to try and, you know, come to terms with because I think it's what four shutouts he's had, but then has been five, you know, really. I mean, or two, four and two thirds because uh, he had the one in Anaheim. I right. think it was where Helberg came in. But anyway, sorry. No, no, but, like, it, that's exactly it, right? Like, he's had these moments where he's been excellent, but then whether it's the injury with coming out of that game, but after that he looked excellent for, like, a solid month there. And then recently, you know, gets the early call in Toronto, and then it was, what, Washington right after the new year where he let in a few softies, and same the case against Buffalo. It's, yeah, he's going through that stretch right now, and I guess it it's a good uh, segue into this next point of what are the Penguins going to do with the goalie situation past this year because – Right, they've locked up Tristan long term here, committed to him. Ned is not in that case. Ned is a guy who's on a one year deal. They brought him in uh, after those down seasons in Detroit. 
Um, somebody wrote it into you and you discussed it a little bit in from the point, but I'll, you know, what is Nedeljkovic's success? What does this mean for these next couple of months as we get closer to the trade deadline? What does that mean for his future in Pittsburgh? Because you got to believe he's going to command more than the whatever it was, 1.5 million he got this offseason, right? Yeah, I mean, this there's still a lot to be decided here, both in terms of how the season plays out on an individual, individual basis for Ned, but also for the team as well. Um, if, let's assume, Nadalkovich keeps this going, um, you know, he, he's obviously going to be due for a bigger contract. I don't know if he's making $4 million a year, but if he puts up these kind of numbers, he's been one of the league's you know, best goalies uh, in terms of some of the advanced statistics as well. But if he continues to do this, yeah, like he's probably looking at a multi-year contract, um, you know, somewhere between two to three million, I would think, um, just kind of based on his overall track record. And, you know, someone could say, okay, like this guy can be a starter or a true platoon guy. And at that point, I don't know if the Penguins can afford that, given how tight they are up against the salary cap. Um, there's a whole Jake Gensel situation looming out there, which we'll get into. So, yeah, so Nadalkovich has a chance to, to make himself a little bit of money here if he keeps this going and also potentially earn a chance to, you know, for more playing time here or elsewhere. Um, and if the Pens should falter, if they somehow go in a nosedive here and they fall out of playoff position, the 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 what you're referring to and from the point is I had a reader um, send me a pretty smart question just saying, like, is this guy maybe their best trade ship if things go south? And I, I had not thought of that possibility, but I do think it's true. Like, there's a lot of contenders who are looking for goaltending and if, you know, they feel that Nadalkovich can be, you know, the answer or part of an answer to their problems, like he only makes $1.5 million. That's an easy contract to fit under the cap. So, yeah, there's a lot here kind of to be answered over the next, you know, six, seven, eight weeks before the trade deadline and then kind of going from there. But, yeah, it's uh, Nadalkovich has certainly put himself in the position to, you know, earn more opportunity here or elsewhere and also potentially more money. Yeah, it's certainly a topic we're catching on here early, uh, as you mentioned, right? We still got them until uh, early March, until the trade deadline, but it feels like something that's worth mentioning more so because of what uh, President Kyle Dubas mentioned. I think that was about a month or so ago, how there was kind of like this arbitrary deadline of around the All-Star game of how the Penguins would be operating. So um, Nedeljkovic comes to mind on that end, just given where this team is right now, how the playoff picture looks in a very crowded East, so... He's somebody that's certainly of interest just given the way that he has played. And uh, so kudos to the reader who reached out to you with that question. I found that an interesting one. Doing our work for us. I like it. <laughs> um, on that note, though, of players uh, with the trade deadline, I want to segue into that conversation about Gensel. Um, I'll put this one in your corner. Um, you've been kept up to date or keeping readers up to date on this with the latest star on the Gensel front. Um, an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. Uh, what's the latest we're hearing from Gensel's camp? Yeah, his uh, Gensel's agent, Ben Hankinson, uh, went on NHL Network Radio on Sirius XM and, you know, talked a little bit about his situation with the Penguins. I mean, he said Jake loves Pittsburgh. Um, you know, obviously he has a great relationship with Sidney Crosby. Um, but he also said, OK, like, you know, this has an opportunity. The words he used were to get ugly if um, and I don't know, entirely know what that means, but if they're not able to get something done with Gensel here. Um, maybe that was like an overstep there by Hankinson. I don't know if get ugly is the right word, but I think the point is, is like, yeah, like he could be gone. He could leave. And if the Penguins don't make a decision here before the trade deadline, um, he could potentially walk um, and the Pens would get nothing to return. I mean, me just kind of like looking at this one from afar, um, it kind of feels like this is just an effort for from the agent to put pressure on the Penguins to, you know, step up to the plate and get something done. Um, you know, Jake has played really well this year. It doesn't appear to be affecting him, the pending contract status, but maybe it is. Um, you know, it would be understandable. I mean, he's got a young family. He spent a long time here. I, I do think he wants to be here. Um, so maybe he just wants to kind of get this out of the way. I mean, when Jake's been asked about it uh, by us reporters, he's basically said, you know, I'm not going to talk about my contract. I'm just focused on fishing out the year. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of play here. I mean, I do think the Penguins want to keep this guy. It's just a question, as always, like, what is the right price? Um, you know, you look at their past negotiations with Latang and Malkin, obviously different front office, but, um, you know, those guys kind of slot into the certain salary structure. Those guys are making around $6 million a year. I, I think Jake is going to look at that and say, okay, like, I need to be making a lot more than that. 
I think he's probably going to get less than Sidney Crosby, who makes eight point seven million dollars a year. Um, so we're talking about what's what's that middle there to to find it in terms of the salary and also the term. Um, so I think it's a lot to sort out. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if things are going to be you know off the table. Talks are going to be off the table the rest of the season here, or if the two sides will start to get more serious closer to the trade deadline. Um, you know, but obviously it's uh, an important situation for the present team and also the future of the Penguins. And, um, you know, we'll see how everything sorts out. I mean, if they do, if it does pivot and they do get to the point where they're like, okay, we're not going to resign this guy. Um, we have to trade him. Uh, I think Jake would immediately become probably the, the best uh, available player at the trade deadline. And it's an interesting point that you bring up there because uh, you mentioned not being able to, in hypothetically speaking, if they weren't able to get him uh, signed long term, you know, what if that coincides? And maybe this is a hypothetical that isn't possible, but my mind goes to what if that's the reality and the Penguins are in a playoff spot by that juncture? They've played well for all of January, beginning of February. They're in a playoff spot, but it doesn't look like they're going to be able to retain Gensel. Is that at a point where you're saying we're going all in, we're staying with this current pl uh, plan? Or do you sell them off for pieces that remain you competitive in the time being? Like, what would be your expectation if the Penguins are in a playoff spot? I guess is what I'm asking. Is there any conceivable way that they move off of Jake, or are they going to keep him throughout this? Just based on their pure moves to this point, going for it and getting Carlson, kind of their public comments, it would be very surprising if they were in a playoff spot and they thought they had a chance with this team to just sell them for picks. Now, I don't know if there's some sort of hockey trade out there where they feel like they can get a guy with term who's an impactful player or maybe two players that, you know, like doesn't significantly impact the present. I, I guess that could happen, but I would be very surprised, um, you know, if they felt they had a chance to do something in the playoffs. So they said, OK, like we're punting. I mean, they're very clearly all in. You don't make that trade for Eric Carlson. Um, and that's not to say the Penguins can't pivot with that vision. But, um, you know, under this scenario, they're. They're in playoff position. And another thing to consider, too, with the whole Jake stuff is there's another guy who's going to be a free agent in a year, and his name's Sidney Crosby. Um, and now Sid isn't the GM or the shadow GM, um, but they do want him to be here. He has a great relationship with Jake on and off the ice. Um, he wants to win. So if the Penguins were to move on from Jake Gensel for future assets or, or let him walk in free agency, you would think that would, um, you know, affect the situation with Sidney Crosby. So that's just one more thing to keep in mind here as they look to sort out this situation. It's not about just Jake. It's it's about his, his center as well. Certainly a situation that we'll be sure to keep tabs on here as we move forward, especially closing in the trade deadline. But something I wanted to bring up, just given the comments that Hankinson made with NHL Network Radio, uh, or NHL Radio, excuse me, through Sirius XM. Uh, one player, though, I want to segue this conversation to the blue line. Um, one that Penguins fans might feel a little bit more excited about the proposition of the team moving off of Ryan Graves. Obviously, no disrespect meant there with that comment, but um, this year we've seen what's happened with him with coming aboard in his first season has now been moved to partnering with uh, Chad Ruedel. Um, this situation with Ryan Graves, uh, you've written about it. We've talked about it. Um, is, there, is this the right way to navigate the situation or is Mike Sullivan simply kind of running out of options of how to manage this? No, I mean, it, honestly, this is like kind of a similar situation to Brian Dumoulin last year, the guy that Graves has brought in to replace. Um, you know, sure, it's a little bit more disappointing given that Graves signed that big contract and, and Dumo was clearly kind of on his last legs here in Pittsburgh last year. But still, yeah, it's the same kind of playbook. I mean, they gave him an opportunity to play through it. They had him switch partners going from Latang to Carlson. And when the struggles continued, and it's just clear confidence. Like this guy is just down on himself right now. He's uncertain. He's kind of talked, you know, Mike Sullivan talked about, um, you know, when guys on the blue line are playing at their best, they're, you know, kind of being instinctual. Um, and that to me tells you that, that maybe Graves is kind of overthinking things. So I think this is the right move to drop him down to the third pair, have him play a little bit less, have him play with more of a defensive oriented guy in Chad Ruedel, um, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, kind of face some more favorable matchups and, and try to get him going. Um, you know, it's been what, two games now. I, I think it's been all right. Graves hasn't been a glaring liability in those games. I, I think a big factor in play here is P.O. Joseph, who's playing in the second pair with Eric Carlson. I mean, I, I think his play is just as important in the short stretch as Graves because, you know, I, I think it's, it's good for the Penguins to 
let Graves kind of play through his struggles and more of a sheltered situation. And, you know, if they're going to be patient and give the time needed to do that, maybe it's only a, a couple of weeks, um, they need PO to not be a liability. So he's kind of a big X factor um, through this stretch as well. I mean, he's been up and down all season. Um, so we'll kind of see how this unfolds here over the, the next one, two weeks. I mean, but I don't think this is, um, you know, like a, a long-term kind of solution here with Graves unless, you know, PO really takes the bull by the horns and uh, all three pairs are kind of clicking the way they're set up now. You mentioned PO, how him being an X factor there. Um, like you said, they would have to take him taking the bull by the horns to be a guy who kind of slots in at that spot with Carlson long-term here. But it is worth noting, it feels like that this, yeah, it hasn't been a great season for PO. He's been out of the lineup for the most part. John Ludwig, they brought him in off waivers, and he's kind of taken the role that P.O. was expected to hold, at least at the early part of the year. Um, how important is this opportunity for P.O. to be with Carlson, um, not just for this year, but I guess for long term for his time here in Pittsburgh, you think? Yeah, I mean, just just in general, like he cannot fall behind Ryan Shea again. I mean, no disrespect to Ryan Shea. He's been a was a nice little surprise for a while, but you know, this is a 26-year-old who didn't make his NHL debut until this year. I mean, the fact that he was playing ahead of P.O., um, you know, it's a little worrisome for P.O. And, and you wonder about his long term future here. So, yeah, I mean, P.O., this is an opportunity for him to show the Penguins, you know, I deserve to be here. I want to be here, um, you know, and, and we'll see how everything kind of plays out with that. I mean, you know, in terms of him, um, you know, I don't I don't know, like what kind of trade option there is there for P.O. If, if things go south from here, um, you know, it's not like he'd give them a ton of cap relief with his contract. And I don't know how much trade value he has around the league. So. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a big stretch for PO just in terms of, you know, kind of the short term with this Penguins team trying to make it to the playoffs and, and get Graves going as well. And also long term for his just future in, in Pittsburgh and also maybe in the NHL going forward. Yeah. want to wrap up before we get into stick taps with one last blue line discussion was a story that you wrote uh, for the paper on Sunday. Talking a little bit about Marcus Pedersen coming at the heels of 400 career games for him. Um, you've been a guy who's covered him throughout his time here in Pittsburgh, just He's been such an important player for the Penguins this year. How have you kind of seen him grow and what stood out to you most about his game this season? Well, I'm just going to preemptively give my stick tap to Marcus Pedersen. Let's <laughs> just get it out of the way here. Um, yeah, Marcus is having a career year. Um, you know, we you talk about P.O., you you know, in terms of guys, young defensemen, it, it's, it's difficult for a lot of these guys to come in um, and play in the NHL. I mean, not only just from the physical demands of the position, um, particularly for guys like P.O. and Marcus, who aren't like the biggest, strongest guys. Um, but also, I mean, Mike Sullivan has talked about this as well, too. Just like, um, you know, it's a position where you everything's in front of you is the way he put it. And you have to read and react to everything. And it's just a lot of decision making. Um, so it, it just takes defensemen time to kind of find their stride. And, and, you know, sometimes they don't do it. But Marcus is a guy who has. Um, and he talked about experience. Um, particularly in terms of defending the rush and maybe making some decisions in the offensive zone, just kind of like learning to pick his battles and letting the play come to him. So that kind of falls in line with what Mike Sullivan said about the position. But yeah, if you look at PO, I mean, the first three years he was up and down. Um, you know, it was a healthy scratch down the stretch a couple of years ago. Last year, he finally kind of found consistency uh, and he still found himself in trade rumors at the deadline or I shouldn't say rumors. He was in trade talks at the deadline. Um, and the Penguins are fortunate that that didn't work out because he's having a career year. Um, you know, he's, he's not only has he been consistent. I mean, I don't know. I have a hard time remembering a game or even many plays where Patterson was a problem this year. Um, and he's also upped his offensive game a little bit. Um, I mean, he's just great on defending the rush. I mean, two on ones, it feels like he just like lays down his body and just takes everything away. Um, he's top two, top three in the league in terms of denials at the blue line per sport logic. So it's just a lot of little things coming together. Um, but the way he put it is just kind of like knowing to pick his battles and just letting the game come to him. And it definitely like lines up with the stats and also just kind of the eye test of what your mark is playing. Yeah, it's been such an entertaining watch, like you said, with one well, anytime it's a two on one and he just drops down into that full spread on the ice. It's it's so so fun to watch because it's a guy who just seems to have no problem absorbing any pucks, any hits, anything like that. But um, and he makes it look easy, but it's the timing of it, which is 
something that the Penguins have changed the last couple of years, how they defend two and one specifically or, or those type of plays. But um, it's not an easy thing to do in terms of the timing. Um, you can look really bad if you mistime it. Um, we've seen we've seen that with Chris Letang um, sometimes over the years. But um, yeah, it's it's he he makes it look easy. Yeah, it's effortless. It's graceful. I mean, I'd look horrible on the ice just because I can't really skate anyway. But that's neither here nor there. Um, well, you are the you know the the bar to which <laughs> every player must clear for sure. Yeah, I, I'm the standard, the gold standard. But he's been such a fun watch, and I've enjoyed watching Pedersen this year and. Um, it's just, yeah, he's been huge for them. And I, I think an unsung part of it too, is that they've brought in new guys in the blue line, like a Carlson, and he's helped make that transition easier for those guys to some degree, right? Whenever he's, whoever he's paired with, it's just been easy. Um, he's had experience with Latang, but now being with him, it's looked like they've been doing it for years. So he's certainly worthy of the stick tap from, from you, Matt. All right. What's your stick tap? I'm going to Drew O'Connor, who has taken over the spot of Matt Nieto as somebody that I probably write about too much this year. But um, he's just been really solid for the Penguins recently. Um, and I think one thing that was really interesting um, from the time in Boston on that quick one-game road trip was both him and Mike Sullivan talking about um, him being a guy who's using his frame more, who's actually driving to the net, not being afraid to get to that blue paint. And that's important when you mentioned the bottom six scoring earlier in the podcast, getting that from these guys. Um, O'Connor skated on that top six, has been there in the, either Sid or Gino's line out of injury necessity when Rust or Raquel was injured. But um, if he can contribute like this on the third line, that bodes really well for the Penguins. Whether that is constant, whether that's consistent remains to be seen. But it seems like he has actually taken a stride forward this year, that it's not just coach speak or things being said from the teammates to prop him up, that there are some tangible pieces of evidence of him taking a step forward, which seems like that's pretty important for the Penguins. Indeed. <laughs> Glad we're on the same page. Uh, I need to let you get over to the arena, and you need to make sure you bring some pretzels back for me. Is that okay? I can make no promises. My family wants pretzels. Um, it's a long drive across the turnpike. They probably won't make it. Well, it was a good effort. I tried. Regardless, you head yourself over to the skate. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with you later. But in the meantime, keep up with all our content on post-gazette.com. For more Penguins coverage with the Penguins in action against the Flyers. And we will catch you all again next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.